This video is meant to give a brief overview of how to design a decent performance common emitter amplifier. This circuit is what you'll typically find when you search for a common emitter amplifier. However, it has a couple issues with it. Primarily that the gain can be largely unstable and variable between different builds of the same circuit. So we're going to modify that circuit with a few components around the emitter of the transistor. Here they're shown as RE1, RE2, and CE. We're going to use a 2N3904 transistor. We're going to presume that we have a 20 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak sine wave with our lowest frequency of interest being 1 kilohertz. And we're going to try to get a 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak output signal from this circuit. So from those numbers of 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak output and 20 millivolts peak-to-peak -peak input, we get a required gain of 50. Next, we're going to start the design by choosing a few design criteria just to get us in the right direction as far as our calculations. First, we're going to choose our power supply to be 12 volts, just because it's a commonly available voltage. We're going to choose our collector to emitter voltage for bias to be 3 volts and we want 1 milliamps of bias current flowing through the collector of the transistor. That number was chosen from the data sheet because 1 milliamp is where they characterize a lot of the performance parameters of the transistor. One of those being our expected beta for the transistor of 70. And then also we can calculate one other value called little re which typically is ignored in the original circuit that I showed you. But in this circuit we're going to build, if you ignore it, you will have significant error in your gain. So it is simply calculated by taking VT, which is a constant of 0.025 volts, and dividing it by the collector current of 1 milliamp, which gives us 25 ohms. <laughs> Next, we're going to choose our collector terminal voltage to be halfway between our power rails, so 6 volts in this case, and that's completely arbitrary. It could be any number of different values. And we're also just going to arbitrarily choose our current through the voltage divider on the base terminal to be 10 times the base current. And our final arbitrary choice is the impedance of our collector, sorry, our emitter capacitor. CE to be much less than little re. And we're going to choose all of our values of resistors and capacitors to be standard values you can get out of your parts bin. Using our value for collector voltage and collector current, we can now calculate the value for RC. So we take 12 volts minus 6 volts at the collector terminal and divide that by 1 milliamp through the collector resistor we get 6,000 ohms, and the nearest value is 5.6K. Next, assuming we can use our expected beta of 70, we can take our collector current, divide by beta, and that'll give us our base current, which in this case is 14 microamps. Therefore, we can take our emitter voltage and divide by our emitter current, which now we know both of those numbers because we have emitter voltage is simply collector voltage subtract our collector to emitter voltage that we chose as 3 volts so now we have 6 volts minus 3 volts and divide that by our collector current plus our base current so we have 1, mi one milliamp plus 14 microamps for that emitter current and that gives us about 3000 ohms exactly which is a standard value Next, we're going to use our value of 0.7 volts for the base to emitter voltage, which we got from a data sheet of the transistor. And we're going to calculate our bias resistors, R1 and R2, by taking the emitter voltage of 3 volts, adding the 0.7 volts we expect at the base to emitter junction, and then using our assumption that we wanted 10 times 
the base current flowing through our divider resistors, we now know from that that we have 12 volts minus our 3.7 volts across the top resistor, R1. Divide that by our 140 microamps, which is 10 times our base current. 140 microamps plus our 14 that branches off to flow through the base terminal. So we have a total of 154 microamps flowing through that top resistor. That gives us 56,000 ohms. For the lower resistor, R2, we take that 3.7 volts, which is between the resistor terminal and ground, and divide by the 140 microamps, which we have flowing through it, gives us 27,000 ohms for R2. And to calculate the final resistor, which is RE2, we simply use the gain equation for a common emitter amplifier, which is gain is equal to collector resistance divided by emitter resistance for the signal. And in this case, our signal is going to mostly flow through RE2 and not RE1 because RE1 is 3,000 ohms. And as you can see, if emitter resistance was 3,000 ohms, the gain would be nowhere near 50. So we can just presume we can ignore RE1 in this case and focus solely on the only other two resistances for the signal in the emitter, which are little RE and RE2. If you put little RE into that equation and solve for RE2, you'll find it equals 87 ohms, which is close to the standard value of 82 ohms. And from there, you can see that if we had ignored little RE, like you typically do for the common emitter circuit that was shown at the beginning of the video, our error would be significant because 25 is a significant portion of 82. Next we're going to calculate our emitter capacitor, which from our assumption we wanted its impedance to simply be much less than little re, which is 25 ohms, so we're just going to cho choose it to be 5 ohms. Using the equation for a capacitor's impedance, which is impedance equal to 1 divided by 2 pi fc, where f is our lowest frequency of interest, we substitute those values in of 5 ohms and 1 kilohertz, and we solve for CE, we get 33 microfarads for our emitter capacitor value. Then finally, we have two more capacitors to calculate, the input and output capacitors. And depending on your application, you might want to calculate these, or you might just want to throw in a sufficiently large value capacitor. We're going to calculate them just to show one method of doing it, and this is by no means a perfect method. Uh, the equation is not exact, but it's a rough approximation that works. We're going to say we want our impedance for the input capacitor, C1, to be much less than this expression, which is 0.1 times beta times RE2 multiplied, or sorry, in parallel with the parallel combination of R1 and R2. Throwing all of those values into that equation, we get 560 ohms. So if we want our impedance to be much less than 560, we're just going to arbitrarily choose 56. And that again is at 1 kilohertz. And using that same capacitor impedance equation, we can throw 56 ohms and 1 kilohertz into the equation and solve for C1 we get 3.3 microfarads. And then our output capacitor, we're going to choose just to be bigger than C1. So we're going to choose 10 microfarads because it's again a standard value. The reason we calculate C2 to be just bigger than C1 is because C1 actually forms a high pass filter on the input of this amplifier. And if C2 were just chosen to be the same value or even just a little bit bigger, then C2 would contribute as another high pass filter and start to affect the accuracy at the low end of our frequency band. So by choosing C2 to just be bigger than C1, sufficiently bigger than C1, we can get 
reasonable performance over our entire frequency band of interest. Now after choosing the parts out of my parts bin, you'll see that almost all the values are pretty much spot on to where they're supposed to be for component values. And then also, after building the circuit, I measured VB, VC, and VE. And they are all very close to where they're supposed to be. Using those resistor values that I measured and the voltages in the circuit that I built, I calculated IC and IB and find IC is very close to what we designed it to be. And IB, albeit it's not 14 microamps, it's about one third of that, it's still sufficiently close and there's transistor characteristics that will vary that likely are causing that inaccuracy. Uh, but in the end you'll see it doesn't really affect the end performance of our circuit. So using our output capacitor of 10 microfarads, I used a decade resistor as the load and was able to drive up to a 40,000 ohm resistor before affecting the output amplitude meaning that if I drop the resistance below 40,000 ohms, it starts to drop the amplitude of the output signal. And just for experimentation's sake, I switched the output capacitor to 4.7 microfarads, and the output impedance was only able to be 60,000 ohms. And then I switched back to the 10 microfarad capacitor and 40,000 ohm load, with a 20 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak input and swept the frequency of the input and measured the output signal amplitude and found that at 1 kilohertz we have a 960 millivolt output signal which is only 4% off from our theoretical value of 1 volt. And then at 100 kilohertz we get 0.9 volts as our output voltage and then at 500 kilohertz we find 0.7 volts as our amplitude which is effectively the bandwidth of our amplifier, which is negative 3 dB down from our starting amplitude of 1 volt peak to peak. As you can see, this circuit is relatively simple to build, and if built on a printed circuit board or using slightly more accurate component values and maybe a hand selected transistor we could get much higher performance characteristics out of the circuit, but for the purposes of this video, it's more than adequate and it's fairly stable. And as you can see, with a 20 millivolt input, with the oscilloscope set to half a volt per division, it's very, very close to one volt peak to peak. And that is a simple way to add just a few components to our circuit to achieve a much higher performance output.